A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello and welcome back to the latest update from the Met Office. Some showers will continue overnight, but otherwise it turns drier with clear spells and it turns chilly in places with our air now coming from the north. That's a cold direction and with isobars out and opening out as well. Lighter winds will mean a greater chance of a frost. There will be widespread clear skies across the UK as the showers fade away, although one or two showers will continue across Northern Ireland parts of Wales and the southwest, more especially for northeast Scotland, the North Sea coast as well. Some of the showers in northern Scotland will be falling as snow because it's going to be a cold night. Touch of frost here and there as we start off Wednesday. But beautiful blue skies for many of us, particularly through this central swathe of the UK. I think still the north and east of Scotland, eastern England, seeing a brisk breeze from the north and some showers. Also some showers elsewhere from the word go. But generally turning drier in many places by the afternoon, albeit rather cloudy. Northern Ireland seeing rain arrive and it will feel cold here, 7 Celsius, not much better elsewhere, 11 to 13 degrees at their highest in the south. But Thursday starts off bright once again, chilly in places, and we keep the brightness across the south and southeast well into the afternoon whilst the cloud thickens across the north and northwest with outbreaks of rain moving south across Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England. The rain clears up on Friday. The weekend looks very nice indeed. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel.
It's 9 p.m. I'm Patrick Christie's and breaking tonight. At least a dozen officers are reportedly investigating multiple allegations against Angela Rayner, including tax matters, the electoral register, and other issues. What's going on, and all kinds of death threats, and um, we had a bomb scare. One of my staff uh, had a attempted break-in at her flat. A rare victory for common sense and multiculturalism. What's happened? What's happened? Oh, ask the Marxists that legally held opinions from people who are going to win national elections is no longer acceptable here. Democracy dies in Europe. It's very loud up here, it's very windy. We've dropped a banner over the edge, securely tied, that says just stop oil. I'd do it again, says the activist who made a man miss his own father's funeral. And they tell me that they're promised work here, promised living accommodation, that's going to be nice. And then when you speak to people six months, 12 months down the line, they do tell a very different story. It's non-stop Vietnamese channel migrants. <laughs> Denmark's Notre Dame moment. Isn't the government interested in fulfilling its obligations under international law by protecting Palestinian women and children from Israeli airstrikes. But would Labour back Iran on penalties against Israel? Oh, my panel this evening is ex-MEP Patrick O'Flynn, Tory Deputy Chairman Jonathan Gullis and broadcaster and author Amy Nicole Turner. And what sparked this Parliament punch-up? <laughs> Get ready, Britain. Here we go. Breaking tonight, the allegations against Angela Rayner. Next. Patrick, thank you. Well, the top story from the GB Newsroom tonight, and we start with some breaking news. The Times newspaper is reporting this evening that the deputy Labour leader, Angela Rayner, is the subject of a multiple lead police investigation concerning, we understand, alleged electoral law offences. The paper also says that police are looking into Miss Rayner's personal tax affairs on top of allegations that she supplied false information for the electoral register when she lived between her two former council houses in Stockport over ten years ago. Miss Rayner has previously said she'll step down if it's found that she's committed any crime while insisting she's always followed the rules. Well, in other news tonight, the Prime Minister has told his Israeli counterpart that now is a moment for calm heads as Israel considers its response to Iran's missile and drone attack at the weekend. Rishi Sunak spoke to Benjamin Netanyahu on a call tonight that had been delayed 24 hours. And yesterday, Israeli media was reporting Mr Netanyahu was refusing to take calls from world leaders seeking to influence his country's response. Israel has encouraged 32 countries, meanwhile, to impose sanctions on Iran's weapons programme after a Council of War meeting earlier on this week. In news here at home, Downing Street says the attempt by police in Brussels to shut down the national conservatism conference is extremely disturbing. Officers arrived while GB News presenter Nigel Farage was addressing the event, giving everyone 15 minutes to leave the venue. It's understood the order came from the local Brussels mayor, Emir Keir, in a move he said was to guarantee public safety. Belgium's Prime Minister described the mayor's actions as unacceptable, saying that the Belgian constitution has guaranteed the freedom of speech and peaceful assembly in his country since 1830. The Education Secretary said today a court ruling dismissing a Muslim student's challenge against her school prayer ban now gives school heads confidence in making the right decisions to prioritise tolerance between those of different faiths. The student had argued that a no-prayer ritual policy at a school in North London was discriminatory, but the head teacher argued schools shouldn't be forced to change their approach because a child or a parent decided it was something they didn't like. 
Well, the judge upheld the school's position, saying there was a rational connection between the school's inclusivity, social cohesion and its prayer policy. And just lastly, a portrait of Winston Churchill could fetch up to £800,000 at auction. That's the guess anyway. The Houses of Parliament had commissioned a British artist to paint a portrait of the wartime Prime Minister for his 80th birthday back in 1954. Well, it's on public display until April the 21st, displayed in the room where Sir Winston was born. Actually, 150 years ago. It's an oil on canvas. Uh, it's going to travel from London to Sotheby's in New York for a period of time and then, in June, it will go to auction with that guide price. We'll keep you up to date on how that goes. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Yes, a last-minute change to the top of tonight's show, to that huge breaking news. The police investigation into Angela Rayner is examining multiple allegations and is not merely limited to potential electoral law offences. That's according to reports that have just come out this evening. A source has told The Times that at least a dozen officers at Greater Manchester Police are investigating the Labour deputy leader over where she lived in the 2010s and the sale of her former council house in Stockport. Police are reportedly examining tax matters and other issues on top of the question of whether Rayner gave false information for the electoral register when she lived between two former council houses in Stockport in the 2010s. Look, to hopefully shed a little bit more light on this, I'm joined now by the political correspondent at The Spectator. It's James Hill. James, look, thank you very, very much. So what are these latest developments then? It's just landed moments ago. Yes, absolutely. So this is a story in The Times and it reveals that the investigation by Greater Manchester Police into Angela Rayner isn't going to be confined to just issues around the Representation of the People Act, it's the electoral law element. Uh, and of course, that's significant because those offences are meant to be registered and investigated within 12 months. So, of course, now we're talking about different things. Uh, we don't know, for instance, the kind of exact detail of what they're looking into. But one potential issue, if it's involving two different houses, is capital gains tax, of course. And there is no kind of statutory limit on that, which means that potentially you could see an investigation and potential criminal offences, etc., being committed, uh, and it wouldn't have a time limit on it. And so that's what we're really interested in. I've just been talking to some uh, Conservative MPs, and they say, you know, look, it, it's tax that really ought to be the thing that, if it's going to do for her, that's the thing that's going to do for her, because, you know, there is no limitation on that. And, of course, that's the thing that, for instance, for Nadim Zahawi, and some of them are pushing now for an HMRC investigation as well. So I think this is quite a significant development tonight, and The Times also reveals that at least a dozen officers are involved in this. So quite a big investigation from the sounds of it, Patrick. Yeah, a, a very big investigation. And, look, one would imagine Angela Rayner denies any wrongdoing. The latest that we've heard from her is that she welcomes a police investigation. It's an opportunity for her to clear her name. So, obviously, we have to leave uh, that ball in her court when it comes to that. Um, however, has she set herself up for a potential fail here? Because I think she said, hasn't she, well, look, she will resign if, indeed, the police find any wrongdoing. Well, it now looks as though the scope of that investigation is going to be looking at more allegations than we thought. So the chances are higher, presumably. I think she had to do it, Patrick, if I'm honest with you. Like, given what she said previously about Boris Johnson and defences, etc., uh, it was the only way out for her. And I actually think, interestingly, by raising the stakes and saying, I am going to resign if I am found guilty, that almost puts more pressure on Greater Manchester Police because they're now under pressure to uh, basically be really competent in their evidence and their case against her because they know they're going to... Cause the resignation of the person who basically wants to be the next deputy prime minister of this country. So they're going to make sure they're 100% watertight, absolutely sure in their evidence. Uh, and I think Rayner's response, backed into a corner over the past eight weeks, uh, was the only thing she could do. I, I've just actually, literally this second, been provided with a statement from Angela Rayner. So this has uh, apparently... Uh, just come through to us. Uh, she says, I've repeatedly said that I would welcome the chance to sit down with the appropriate authorities, including the police and HMRC, to set out the facts and draw a line under this matter. I'm completely confident I've followed the rules at all times. I've always said that integrity and accountability are important in politics. That's why it's important that this is urgently looked at independently and without political interference. Uh, look, I, I, 
I may well stand corrected on this, James, but I, I do believe that that might be a regurgitation of uh, what was said actually on Friday from her. So it doesn't look like we've had too much movement from the Rainer camp, despite, and I will just reiterate to our viewers and listeners now, if you are just joining us, this report that has just landed in the Times. Angela Rayner, police investigate multiple allegations. Uh, the force is examining tax matters and other issues involving the Labour deputy leader as questions continue over the council house sale. This involves, as we understand it, at least a dozen officers now at Greater Manchester Police. Uh, and it's about where she lived in the 2010s. But it understands, and this is the crucial bit, James, that police are examining tax matters and other issues on top of the question of whether Rayner gave false information for the electoral register when she lived between two former council houses in Stockport in the 2010s. So things have just got more serious for the Labour deputy leader, haven't they? Yes, absolutely. This is a more wide-ranging investigation than some previously led us to believe. Uh, and as you say there, Patrick, you know, that statement basically is the same thing she said on Friday. Mm. I'm not surprised. You know, of course, what else could she say? Of course, she's going to welcome uh, a police investigation and try and ward against any political interference. Uh, but the fact remains this is more significant than I think some perhaps were saying on Friday. So uh, I will wait to see what that investigation does. But GMP does seem to be taking it seriously, as they really ought to should, given the magnitude of the case involved here. Look, James, can I just thank you very, very much for coming on at short notice as well. That is James Heal there, who's uh, the political guru at The Spectator. Um, right, so look, we will keep you up to date on any ongoing developments in that story. Like I've said, it has just landed in front of us now that the police investigation into Angela Rayner appears to be assessing anyway more allegations than initially first thought. She obviously welcomes the police investigation, as she said, denies any wrongdoing. We will keep you up to date. But I will crack on with the show as we had planned before that breaking news. So, a Muslim pupil lost her high court battle against a prayer ban in her school. Good. This is a rare victory for common sense and integration. It is arrogant and wrong to expect a school to change its rules to work around you and your faith. Now, Catherine Burblesing, the founder and head teacher of the Michaela Community School, took on the mob and won. Ofsted rates it as an outstanding school. It gets kids into top universities. It is strict but it gets results, and crucially, parents sent their children to that school knowing that there was no official prayer room. Then one pupil decided to kick up a stink, saying that their right to religious freedom was being offended, and it ended up in the High Court. But it wasn't just that pupil, OK? An organised militia of hardliners from outside the school tried to intimidate the school into bending to their religious wishes. Now, earlier this year, I went to the Michaela Academy and I spoke to head teacher Catherine Burbleson. All kinds of death threats and um, we had a bomb scare. Uh, the police had to come and search the school uh, for bombs. Um, uh, we, we had all kinds of... One of my teachers, one of my black teachers, was so badly racially abused. One of my staff uh, had a attempted break-in at her flat. Uh, one of my staff had a brick through her window. Um, we had bottles thrown into the yard. Um, and all because of the prayer situation. And um, so it was horrible. And um, my staff were terrified. Integration is not about coming to a country and trying to change that country's way of life or making a country pander to your own religious norms. This should give thought to how multiculturalism can work. What I find is that the left say, well, multiculturalism, everybody's free, do whatever you want, isn't it great? The right say, multiculturalism's failed, there's nothing we can do about it. I think that we all need to actively try and encourage multiculturalism and encourage children to, to be friends across racial and religious divides. And this is why it's common sense. If this country is going to come together, it can't just keep pandering to the loudest people. Half of the pupils in that school, apparently, are Muslim. So what about the other half? Who would have their education impacted as a result of all of this? And people are critical of this and say, well, well, what about the children who don't want to pray? What about the children who don't want to fast? What about the families who are happy with this? Now, they might say, no, but everybody should be able to do whatever they want. But that isn't the case at our school, right? right? Our school, we behave very much as a collective. We do not separate children according, according to race, race and religion. That was the other thing that was interesting, is that once uh, prayer stopped, everything returned to normal. That was Catherine Burble saying there, talking to me on this show earlier this year. But today, the judge ruled that the prayer ban was lawful.
It is a huge victory for common sense. It is a huge victory for integration. And it's a huge victory for Britain. Let's get the thoughts of my panel this evening. I am joined by columnist, political commentator Patrick O'Flynn. I've got the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, Jonathan Gullis, and the author and broadcaster Amy Nicole Turner. Patrick, I will start with you. Do you back this decision then? Oh, definitely. I th I'm still troubled that legal aid of, I think, up to £150,000 was provided, taxpayer funded, uh, for this vexatious uh, legal uh, claim. I think Catherine Burble sings an inspiring head teacher. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important that the principle that a head teacher gets to set the ethos uh, of a school. Mm -hmm. uh, is upheld. And I also think when you have um, a hardcore, you know, Islamic campaigners taking you on over an aspect of your regime, you know, that's very intimidating, mm. given th other things that have happened. Well, you know, but, I mean, bomb threats and all sorts exactly. and teachers followed home and all of that. And, Jonathan, I think that, for me, is, is the wider issue here, because it wasn't actually just this pupil that was involved and their parents as well. You know, it was very, very quick for the mob to get involved and for them to take things very seriously. And today, I think, shuts that down legally. Well, look, one thing I'll make perfectly clear is, as someone who was a teacher before becoming a member of parliament, I've actually been to Michaela, I think, two or three now times, uh, twice as a a teacher and once actually as a parliamentarian taking other MPs. So I know Catherine well. I think she's an absolute inspiration. You know, this is this school is outperforming some of the best private schools and grammar schools across the country because she has a very clear regime as she laid out. It's not one rule for one and one rule for another. It's a clear and consistent line that all pupils have to abide by. And in this case, all pupils of all faiths are held to the same standard as any other student. Mm. It is sad that it's had to go through the courts when it's abundantly clear that head teachers are best placed to understand how to educate their children. It is disgraceful that extremists in society are looking to hijack the agenda to threaten and to intimidate, but it's sadly something that we all see far too often. But what I will say about Michaela is they face these intimidations and threats when they first try to set up. Labour councillors and Labour MPs standing up saying this school was awful, that she was mm -hmm. the worst head teacher in the country. And lo and behold, it's eating humble pie finally for them to face. And thank God, like you say, the courts yeah. had a victory for common sense. Amy, what do you think should have happened? Do you think the judgment was wrong? They should have caved in to the religious wishes of certain pupils? I don't think... I think that be, the whole situation being hijacked by extremists is obviously disgraceful and unacceptable, and I hate that whole aspect of it. I also really resent the fact that this ended up in the High Court. I don't think that should have happened at all. But I do have sympathy for the Muslim pupils, and I do think that a prayer room is not an unreasonable demand. Like, when you take a school and you look at individual pupils at your school and they make requests you think what's reasonable and what's and what's not and i think a prayer room at lunchtime for 25 minutes it's not that big a deal and now what, what we're going to see is some pupils at that school praying in say the loo cubicle or a, a broom cupboard or really inappropriate places that aren't saying, acceptable for prayer you're, you're second guessing uh, the head teacher of the school i thought it was really interesting in her reaction today she said that the, the group of pupils that was kind of most at risk in their rights was not the observant uh, Islamic pupils, but the, the, the pupils from other minority faiths. And also, she singled out the uh, pupils from Muslim backgrounds who were less zealously observant. So if you start those prayer rooms, then I think the implication there was there was going to be but huge think... peer group pressure, mm. perhaps reinforced from zealots outside, on those pupils to abandon the secular yeah. ethos and get she, into she, the she heavy said to me, Amy, religion. She said to me, Amy, that what she'd noticed was that some Muslim pupils were not observing Ramadan because they didn't particularly want to, and they were starting to be forced to by other pupils. Mm. And she also said the school would cease to exist if the High Court had made them impose. I, I, I appreciate that. And there was also that example of the girl being asked to leave the choir because it was yeah. considered haram and those types of things. But I still think that there, there's, it's not too much of an ask to have a simple prayer room just based on the fact that religions aren't really equal in the way that they pray. So the fact that a Muslim will have to go onto the floor means that it's not the same as where Christians who could pray in their head, and that's why I think it's not unreasonable to just have a prayer room. Okay. Also, it's impossible to have a secular school in this country because we're the only country in the world that um, 
that still mandates compulsory collective worship. A certain part of the curriculum has to ha include a Christi an element of Christianity still in this country. Mm -hmm. So it's actually not the case that we have any secular schools. Well, having been an RE teacher, we te I taught all well faiths, and yes, there was an element we have to teach 50% about Christianity, but I've talked about Islam, Hinduism, and many other world religions, but and that's about educating. Worship. As for um, uh, Michaela, their lunch times are extremely regimental in a yeah. positive way. Children walk in, they're reciting poetry or reciting important readings and teachings. They have a meal which everyone's having the same amount of food. The kids are clearing up at the end and then it's break time. If you start mixing in prayer time into that as well, yeah. it's going to mean that the school will not function the way it has and the results speak for itself. But it's, it's a state school, right? It's a state school. So, so, just, so, yeah, so, so just send your kids to an Islamic school if you had that. And, and equally, this was the part of the judgment that I found interesting was that, well, the child can just go to a different school. She's yeah. not, it's, it's not mm. impinging on her freedom because she can leave the school. I'll send my kid in her, that child's place instead if that's available. I, I right, believe the parent involved, you're sending another child to that yeah, school and, uh, in September. And the child really? hasn't left the school, well, so she's gone it. back. All, all right, well, well, look, uh, Catherine Birbelsinger said this. A Hero. school should be free to do what is right for the pupils it serves. The court's decision is therefore a victory for all schools. Schools should not be forced by one child and her mother to change its approach simply because they have decided they don't like something at the school. Multiculturalism works at Michaela not because we've emptied the identity space of the school in order to accommodate difference, but because we have a clear identity which anyone can sign up to if they are willing to compromise. Right, well, something I'm not willing to compromise on is our giveaway, because there's still plenty of time to grab your chance to win a Greek cruise. Ooh. Travel goodies and £10,000 in cash. Yes, there we go. Here's all we need. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Still to come, top Daily Mail columnist Quentin Letts calls out the swathes of Labour MPs who seem more concerned about Israel than Iran in ugly common scenes yesterday. Can you guess, as Quentin puts it, which Labour faces would cheer on Iran in a penalty shootout with Israel? The man himself joins me shortly. Plus, Dubai Deluge, yes, the popular holiday and expat destination for Brits, is underwater after flash flooding. I'll bring you the very latest, but next is the head-to-head. -head. The undemocratic European Union exposed its hand today when Belgian cops shut down a Conservative conference in Brussels featuring Nigel Farage and Suella Braverman. Oh, I'm sorry, it's before the watershed. I really can't tell you what I think. He must be, he, he must be the most ghastly little person. Well, Herman Kelly of the Irish Freedom Party clashes with deputy leader of the Rejoin the EU party, Richard Morley, on whether the mayor of Brussels, or at least one of them, because there's loads of them, should apologise to Nigel. That's next. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. I wonder, is this the fundamental distinction we need to make between Islam, which is a, a, a private religion, people may practice freely uh, amongst themselves, and Islamism, when you try and place those values upon other people, place that, that way of being, force it on people who don't want it? I have been very much clear about this thing that Islam is a religion and people are free to follow that religion in the UK, in a Western, free Western society. So we, we have no problem with people following their religion as long as it is not 
being imposed mm. onto the wider society. And when you would, uh, you talk about uh, drawing a distinction between Islam and Islamism, people like me, you and me, we are drawing that distinction. We're trying to maintain that distinction. But if you uh, look at the commentator from the Muslim community, some commentator, they would like to blur this line and they would ask you, what is Islamism? Where does it exist? Sorry, it does exist. Mm. We see it. And the teacher of this incident is an epitome of that kind of, you know, ideology being prevalent, you know, in, in our Khadija, society. Khadija, do you worry so, that there are, that these views are typical for some sections of society? Do you think that there's a problem with some Muslim men that they have perhaps uh, views that we don't consider to be British values? There are certain readings of religion which are misogynistic, which are discriminatory, which are homophobic. We need to be honest about it. We need to be calling it out whenever we hear these kind of views. It's been a long time that we are letting these kind of ideologies crawling in, you know, um, spreading tentacles in British society, and we are just ignoring it in the name of respecting people's culture and mm. religion. You are not suppressing the UK. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's Tonight, only on GB News. Now, coming up, who do you think the average Labour MP would support between Israel and Iran? Journalist Quentin Letts joins me live. But first, should a mayor of Brussels apologise for silencing Nigel Farage? It's time for tonight's Ad to Ad. Absolutely shocking scenes in Brussels earlier today as the city's mayor and police attempted to shut down a Conservative conference featuring Nigel Farage and Suella Braverman. Police were summoned to the venue just as Farage took to the stage. With one local mayor tweeting, I issued an order from the mayor to ban the National Conservatism conference event to guarantee public safety. In Etterbich, Brussels City and San Jose, the far right is not welcome. Well, interesting then that the very same uh, Brussels mayor, or I think the person above him actually, was happy to host ex-paramilitary Iranian official Ali Reza Zakani last summer, despite him being placed under sanctions by the UK. Well, predictably, Nigel was far from happy. No, oh, I'm sorry. It's before the watershed. I really can't tell you what I think. <laughs> he must be—he he must be the most ghastly little person. And the Belgian Prime Minister has since hit back, tweeting that the action was unacceptable and that any banning of political meetings is unconstitutional. So tonight, I am asking, should the Brussels mayor apologise for silencing Nigel Farage? Let me know your thoughts. Head to gbnews.com forward slash your say or tweet me at gbnews. While you're there, why not vote in our poll? The results will follow very shortly. But first, going head to head on this, are the president of the Irish Freedom Party, Herman Kelly, and the deputy leader of the Rejoin EU Party, Richard Morley. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Great to have you both on the show. Herman, I will start with you. Is Nigel Farage owed an apology, do you think? Absolutely. And all the people of Belgium, 
I attended the event myself today. It wasn't just Nigel Farage, Suella Braverman, who I met, but also uh, Viktor Orban, the current Prime Minister of Hungary, the former Prime Minister of Poland. You had a lot of well-known, democratically elected uh, politicians who have the right, and actually they have the public mandate to speak up and uh, to voice their opinion and to be called extremist in any way by by a guy actually who I believe is a gopher for Erdogan. And it wasn't just one uh, mayor, it was actually three mayors because the event was shut down. This was the third attempt. Uh, two venues had already been cancelled because of the political pressure of local mayors in Belgium. So yes, absolutely. He should apologise to Nigel Farage and to the people of Belgium. All right, OK. Richard, Nigel Farage described this as something out of the Soviet Union playbook. I mean, that's what it is, isn't it? Send the boys in blue round on the order of uh, red in the bed. Well, I mean, the mayor of Brussels has a perfectly reasonable and proper duty to uphold public order in the city in which he's been elected. You must remember that the Brussels mayor is speaking for the people of Brussels, and the people of Brussels are not happy to have a right-wing conference held in their city. You must remember also that Europe has actually lived under a fascist government. Brussels was occupied by a fascist regime. Uh, we in Europe know of the dangers that these parties can create far more than the British do, who have never actually experienced it in Britain as it's been experienced here in Europe. Can I just so ask what, what, what fascism was on display today, Richard? Oh, it's not the necessary... No one is saying that the people that were there at the conference today are fascists in the same way as Hitler was. Of course not. Uh, but the point is, you must remember the fear that people have in Europe about right-wing politicians is very, very deep indeed, born from very bitter experience. And the mayor has a perfect right to prevent public Richard, disorder. Richard, I'm sorry, but that, that is, if you don't mind me saying, a bit stupid, right? Because if the people okay. have a fear of something, I mean, like, you know, I've got a fear of spiders, right? But that doesn't stop me being in the same room as them. That doesn't stop me cohabiting with a spider in my flat, does it? And if you're saying that nobody there actually is exhibiting fascist views, then that is an unfounded fear, and they need to grow up, don't they? No, I don't think so at all. You must remember that this... Uh, a basic conference is all about opposing the unity of Europe. It's all about yeah. establishing in independent way. nations in Europe to try to, to basically uh, uh, break up the strength of the European Union. Now, that is extremely important, far more important than your spiders, because, of course, if Europe isn't strong in the face of Russian aggression... Right. If Europe is divided into okay. lots of little nation I've, states I've, I've, that I've then start feeling, warring yeah. against each All other, right. the point I'm is bring, that Nigel Farage, Nigel Farage will be the first person to oppose Viktor Orban if Viktor Orban right. actually had okay. independence All right, from Herman, Europe. I'll, I'll bring you in. I, I just wonder whether or not the mask, the, whether or not the mask yeah, slips slightly right. there, because the actually Russians the reality is that, that, far, that he's saying that... Yeah, OK, you've spoken long enough. Go on, Herman. OK, can I say, is it gone... Godwin's law is it the is this like uh, upper sixth uh, debate where the first person to mention called your opponent Hitler loses. So Richard, you have lost already. Secondly, unlike spiders, the right to free speech is the foundation of a free and democratic society. For people's right to express their opinions and their political opinions in the public sphere is a fundamental right. And the Prime Minister of Belgium said that this evening said what happened was unconstitutional because it undermined the right to free speech and free assembly. Richard, they are the basic fundamentals of European civilization, right? So yes, the, the, whole, to that point? the whole thing that you are, Richard, you are like the Japanese soldier who appeared out of the jungle in the islands there, I, I, I believe it was in... Uh, uh, let me see. Let him, let him come back to that. Let, let him come back to that. Go, go on, Richard, come back to that. You've lost the Brexit referendum, and here. now you're looking the to undermine a fundamental value of free speech. In Richard, you don't care about free speech. That's the allegation. Yes, right. But in this conference, Viktor Orban was one of the premier people speaking. We all think that this conference 
conference was called off because of Nigel Farage, do not think for one moment that Nigel Farage has any importance in Europe whatsoever. But Viktor Orban does. Now, there is a man who has not only suppressed free speech in, in Hungary, but he suppressed anything which opposes him. And this man is centre to this conference. And that is one of the reasons why people were so fearful of this conference, that if that type of politics is allowed to simply run well, right in the streets elected of Richard, Richard. I, Richard, I'll just put it to you that you don't like, you don't like views and you want to cancel them. Oh, Herman, is that the case? Yes, hey, look, but we... Uh, one Victor moment Orban, to come back to you, please. Unlike you, Richard. Richard. Unlike unlike you, you, Richard to you, please. Victor Orban is a democratically elected and he's got a very large majority. And you also had the former Prime Minister of Poland. As was you had Hitler. Representatives from what very was Hitler? Why Richard, did you bring up Hitler? Can I speak, Richard? Because Hitler Richard, was democratically can I speak? elected. Yeah, just you let can't Herman stop. Say because all stop, Richard, was elected, stop, Richard. Richard, he Richard he stop. And let, Richard, let, let Herman finish. It's ridiculous. Go on, Herman. Richard, Viktor Orban is elected, democratically elected of his country with a very large majority. As I said, the former Prime Minister of Poland was there. A lot of very important and well-known political figures were there to have a debate and a forum about politics. Right. When the Prime Minister of Belgium admits that what happened today was against the constitutional, against constitutional rights, I think we should wake up and say, do you know what happened when three mayors tried to they don't have political arguments, uh -huh. so they're using the state police to impose their will when right. when they're their flimsy arguments don't work. All That's right, what's no going chance. on. And you should apologise, Richard. OK. All, all right. Yeah, OK. Well, I don't think we're going to get that, are we? We'll be here all night if that was the case. But look, both of you, thank you very much. Proper head-to-head, -head, as we expect. It's the President of the Irish Freedom Party, Herman Kelly, and the Deputy Leader of Rejoin EU Party, Richard Morley. Right, look, who do you agree with? Should the Mayor of Brussels apologise for shutting down the NatCon conference? Your verdict is now in, and I did see the way this was going on Twitter earlier on, and you do love to see it. This is democracy in action. 49% of you think that the Mayor of Brussels should apologise to Nigel Farage. 51 one percent of you say that he shouldn't. Oh, it's closer, closer than the Brexit referendum. Well done to everybody, and I do mean everybody who took part in that poll. I know who you are. Still to come, a Just Stop Oil protester who caused chaos to 4,000 motorists at Heathrow Airport on the M25 said that she'd do the same again. I will quiz a supporter of the group and a climate activist, Ben Larson, shortly, plus a parliamentary punch-up. <laughs> I'll reveal what sparked that brawl in the next hour, but next. Would Labour MPs sooner cheer on Iran than Israel? Very real tens of thousands of deaths and casualties, Israel's military attacks and imposed famine conditions have caused in Gaza are drivers of regional instability. Top Daily Mail columnist Quentin Letts exposes the Labour faces who'd rather slam Israel than condemn the despotic Iranian regime. He's live and he's next. Hello and welcome back to the latest update from the Met Office. Some showers will continue overnight, but otherwise it turns drier with clear spells and it turns chilly in places with our air now coming from the north. That's a cold direction with isobars out and opening out as well. Lighter winds will mean a greater chance of a frost. There will be widespread clear skies across the UK as the showers fade away, although one or two showers will continue across Northern Ireland. Parts of Wales and the southwest, more especially for northeast Scotland, the North Sea coast as well. Some of the showers in northern Scotland will be falling as snow because it's going to be a cold night. Touch of frost here and there as we start off Wednesday. But beautiful blue skies for many of us, particularly through this central swathe of the UK. I think still the north and east of Scotland, eastern England, seeing a brisk breeze from the north and some showers. Also some showers elsewhere from the word go. But generally turning drier in many places by the afternoon, albeit rather cloudy. Northern Ireland seeing rain arrive and it will feel cold here, 7 Celsius, not much better elsewhere, 11 to 13 degrees at their highest in the south. But Thursday starts off bright once again, chilly in places, and we keep the brightness across the south and southeast well into the afternoon whilst the cloud thickens across the north and northwest with outbreaks of rain moving south across Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England. The rain clears up on Friday. The weekend looks very nice indeed. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. 
Cheryl Baker. Good morning, Cheryl. Good morning. When you think back to 1981, um, I mean, obviously, the 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 ABBA victory then wasn't all that long ago, nine years earlier. Do, do you think they had a huge influence then on the sort of direction that that Eurovision was taking? Yeah, they did. They changed it completely because up to then it had all been very staid and a bit posh, long frock, sticky bow ties, you know. And then they came along and they blew it out of the water. They looked so different. And they modernised it, and I think, yeah, it, it, it made a big change. Made a big change after that. Mm. And we were watching your performance on Eurovision a little bit earlier on of Making Your Mind Up. I mean, you had so much fun, didn't you, up on that stage? Were you, in some part, inspired by ABBA? Um, yes, I would say so. It was... ABBA was 74. I turned professional in 75 and um, did my first song for Europe, which was, you know, the when they choose the British song to go forward. Um, I did my first one in February 1976. So, yeah, it was only months after ABBA's performance that I um, I started my own Eurovision journey. Um, yeah, they, they just changed the face of it. They changed the face of Eurovision. And if you look at what Eurovision is now, I think that all started with ABBA's performance. It made people think this is much more than just a song contest. It's all about the look. I mean, the clothes, they looked fantastic. And even the composer, or not the composer, what's he called, the conductor, he was dressed as Napoleon. It was, it made it fun. Fantastic song, obviously, brilliant singing, but the whole look of it just changed the way that Eurovision is, and, and to this day. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's Tonight. Coming up, could unrepentant Just Stop Oil protesters be prepared to wreak havoc on the UK again? But first, after Iran's unprecedented missile assault on Israel horrified the world, Labour leader Keir Starmer was yesterday swift in his condemnation of the attack. There can be no doubt that the attack perpetrated by Iranian forces this weekend has left the world a more dangerous place. It targeted innocent civilians. With a yeah, but it seems Labour's rabble of boisterous backbenchers didn't quite get the message. Very real tens of thousands of deaths and casualties, Israel's military attacks and imposed famine conditions have caused in Gaza are drivers of regional instability. Will the Prime Minister confirm with the death of those three UK charity workers working for World Central Kitchen, has he received a written apology from the Prime Minister of Israel? Well, those pathetic performances prompted the Daily Mail's parliamentary sketch writer to write, we can guess who plenty of Labour MPs would cheer in an Israel-Iran penalty shootout. Well, I'm very pleased to say I'm joined now by the man behind that headline. It's Quentin Les himself. Quentin, great stuff. Look, is this what we can expect under a Labour government? <laughs> well, hang on, I haven't had the election yet. But, um, you know, sometimes you go to a smart Italian restaurant, I'm sure you do, Patrick, and uh, in the foyer, it's all very calm... There's Vivaldi music playing, the maitre d' is very calm and charming. But behind, in the kitchen, it's absolute chaos and the chefs are all trying to kill each other. And uh, that's very much the feeling of the Labour Party at the moment in, in Parliament. Uh, the front bench, Keir Starmer is, you know, Mr Reasonable, I'm Mr Moderate. Uh, but behind him, uh, all the natives are, are jumping up and down and bearing their chests, beating their chests. Uh, it's, it's almost sort of Potemkin moderatism, uh, moderation by uh, the Labour uh, um, Party at the moment in Parliament. And that was, that was very much the feeling yesterday. Well, you know, can you answer your own question for us here on GP News? You know, how many Labour MPs do you think will be cheering and run over Israel in a penalty shootout? <laughs> Quite a lot of them. And you saw some of them there. You heard Beth Winter uh, from Kynan Valley. Um, there's a man called Mohammed Yassin, uh, from Bedford who wanted uh, us no longer to uh, export arms to Israel. Hang on, this is our ally, Israel, that has just taken 300 uh, drone attacks in one night. Uh, Richard Bergon, Kim, Jen Kim Johnson. You also saw uh, Matt Weston from Leamington Spa there. Uh, I mean, there was an awful lot of them who were um, just itching, itching with anti-Israel feeling. And therefore, you have to ask that if Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer, uh, did become Prime Minister, would he be able to get his way 
or would he be pushed around the place like a supermarket trolley uh, by the Labour movement? And I, I think there's a very strong suspicion that the latter would be the case. Do you think that there's a possibility that if Keir Starmer does become our Prime Minister in you know, a matter of months and the Middle East has not calmed down, which it shows no signs of doing, that he may well end up relying on Tories on the other side of the chamber to get through things that he wants to get through in terms of policy? Well, it depends if there are any Tories. <laughs> if you listen to the opinion polls, it doesn't sound mm. like there are going to be many of them. But uh, the political reality of this, the electoral reality, the parliamentary reality, is that a party leader, a prime minister, is the creature of the backbenches and has to do what the, par what the, what the, parliament, what the party's MPs uh, really want in the end. There's a limit to how much moderation that Sir Keir Starmer is going to get away with uh, if he becomes prime minister. If we have a Labour government then, is it as black and white as to say we would have a Middle East backing government, i.e a more Iranian-backing government, a more sympathetic to Iran government. Uh, it would essentially be bad news for Israel and, dare I say, Israeli-supporting Jews in Britain. Oh, I think we've lost it. We'll never know, will we? Anyway, it's about time anyway. Quentin Les there. Thank you very much. Daily Mail's parliamentary sketch writer to Quentin Les. Right, coming up at 10 p.m., is democracy dying in Europe? I deep dive into the disturbing scenes from Brussels today where a Belgian mayor, one of several different Belgian mayors, shut down that Conservative conference while Nigel Farage and Suella Bradman appeared on stage. Plus, we'll have the latest from Copenhagen as the Danish capital suffers its Notre Dame moment after a historic building went up in flames. But next, this Just Stop Oil protest had disrupted more than 4,000 motorists on the M25 with a nine-mile tailback on the sweltering summer's day in July 2022. Cambridge educated Cressida Gethin has vowed to do it all again despite facing prison next month for her original stunt. I speak to a Just Stop Oil member, and that's next. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Martin Daubney. Weekdays from 3 p.m. SUV drivers in Oxford will face higher parking charges, proposals tabled by the local Green Party or passed by the City Council. The motion argues that heavier cars like SUVs cause more damage to roads, are more likely to seriously injure or kill pedestrians and cause more illnesses due to pollution. However, the Alliance of British Drivers has condemned the plan as absolutely outrageous. Well, let's get the thoughts now of the legendary motoring journalist, Quentin Wilson. Quentin, welcome to the show. Always a pleasure. We hear a lot about the war on motorists, this time targeting SUVs because of their weight and the charges could be astronomical. This idea first started in Paris, now it's coming to Oxford. Can you tell us a bit about how it would work? OK, so the idea is that the, the, the charges will penalise people who drive heavier SUVs and I guess by implication electric cars, although Oxford Council haven't said exactly what they're going to do with, with EVs. But this is all based around this notion of, of, of SUVs being heavier than passenger cars, therefore wearing out the roads more. Now, there was a study, I've got it here in front of me, from the University of Edinburgh in 2022 that said... Um, Real-world tests found that overwhelmingly the wear is caused by large vehicles, buses, heavy good vehicles. Road wear from cars and motorcycles is so low that this is immaterial. Now, obviously, driving around a medieval city like Oxford in an SUV isn't the brightest thing in the world to do. But the idea that we should penalise the owners of these cars based on imperfect science that's been read on social media, I think is completely wrong. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. 
I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Patrick Christie tonight on GB News. Tomorrow's newspaper front pages are coming up. But first, an unrepentant Just Stop Oil protester who delayed thousands of motorists on the M25 insists that she'd do the same again, despite facing a prison sentence for her original stunt in July 2022. We are currently on a gantry above the M25. It's very loud up here, it's very windy. We've dropped a banner over the edge, securely tied, that says just stop oil, because that is what our government must do. It must stop new oil and gas licenses in the North Sea. So Cressida Geffen did cause mayhem to an estimated 4,000 people. She scaled those gantries above the busy motorway near Heathrow Airport. She was convicted in February for causing a public nuisance and faces sentencing next month. The 22-year-old told fellow eco-campaigner Chris Packham in the Radio Times, I would do it all again, but there's one thing I'd do additionally, and I'm considering it. I'd find some way of meeting with anyone who had been affected by what I did so they could tell me how they felt. Well, even if she wanted to... She could instead be languishing in jail for her efforts in just a few weeks. Her friend and fellow Just Up All supporter Ben Larson joins me now. Look, Ben, thank you very much. Great to have you on, on the show. Um, an individual missed his father's funeral because of that, and yet she says she'd do it all again. Would you like to apologise? Uh, Cressida has absolutely nothing to apologise for. I'd just like to make that very clear from the start. Missing, a father's, yeah, to... missing someone's f funeral now? Father's funeral? There's going to be a lot more fathers with a lot more funerals if the government pushes on with their current plans of extracting more, more oil and gas, burning more fossil fuels, and leaving us all to deal with it. it, it it's, it's a global death sentence for so many people, fathers, mothers, children alike. And Cressy is one of the few people who's actually willing to put her money where her mouth is. And, and commit to taking actions to avoid this in the first so, place. Some people might say it is absolutely unbelievably narcissistic to think that it's OK that you have the right to force someone to miss their father's funeral. I, others would say it's unbelievably narcissistic for the government to think that they can continue extracting oil and gas yeah. just to get line the pockets of their mates, while the rest of us are going to be trapped in a war world that's warming... Yeah, at unprecedented rates. I mean, this is if like... If there was a cause so that I cared deeply about, right? If there was a cause that I cared deeply about and, you know, you were on your way, hypothetically, and I, I don't need to know your personal circumstances, I hope this never happens, Ben, but, you know, hypothetically, on your way to your father's funeral, you know, and I stopped you from going there, you'd probably be a bit miffed, wouldn't you? And if I said to you, look, I'd like to just meet up with you, I'd do it all again, but I'd meet up with you afterwards. Do you not think that points to some kind of whopping great big sense of entitlement there? I think that's between Chrissy and that fella, to be honest with you. But well, she's part of your actually, group, Ben. You just said that she's. You just said she's got nothing to apologise for. Me, excuse me, Patrick. Excuse me. I'll answer might be your question if you let me. The actions that Cressy took, not only are they um, justified. Many, many more people across the UK are planning to take similar actions this summer. And mm. if you want to be part, of it, you can go to juststopworld.org. But. If you're serious, like you said, if you've got a cause that you care about, if you're serious about, about um, enacting that change, the way to do it is through mass civil resistance. That's the way politics in this country has changed. It's the way that politics in this country has always changed. Okay? The suffragettes didn't get their rights just by, by waving a placard outside Westminster. You know, if you pick up a history book, this is the way that, that politics but you, you're, changes. You're not the suffragettes, Ben, are you? Let's be honest. I mean, again, is that not just another absolutely astonishing level to your narcissism that you are putting yourself in the same bracket as the suffragettes? Really? I mean, history remembers the suffragettes you know, rather well in, in the fullness of time, whereas what you were doing in terms of annoying the public and making them miss the funerals and making them miss hospital appointments and things like that, I'm not really sure that's Patrick, the do same. Patrick, what do you think? Patrick, if, if GB News was around at the time of the suffragettes, whose side do you think you'd... 
Well, I would have personally definitely been on the side of women having the vote. Oh, that's such bollocks, man. You would have been a reactionary Why? just like the rest. Be because this, like, the actions Just Stop Oil are taking are clearly the socially progressive causes. If, if you, um, we're, we're facing mass climate breakdown, we're facing no mm. crops in the ground. I don't know if you follow the news, Patrick, but crops are literally rotting in the ground at the moment. Okay, that's going to lead to a shortage on the shelves. That's going to lead to mothers and fathers, like you're talking about, not being able to feed their kids. The right thing to do at this point is to get together, get organized. No more protesting about uh, around Parliament. No more waving banners and waving placards. If we're facing 40 degrees of heat, if we're facing no food on the shelves, we need to get serious and start disrupting the government so they have to pay well, Where does this end, Ben? Because, you know, does it then the next stage goes, you know, it's justified to kill political decision makers to make even more of a stand as the situation in your mind becomes more and more extreme and we get closer to that burning point. You know, what's the limit to your actions, Ben? Because you just, you're able to formulate in your own head a complete justification for absolutely everything going forward. It's quite a small leap, actually, to start justifying it other extreme stuff, isn't it? So, will that happen? You're talking, you're talking nonsense, I'm afraid, Patrick. Just Stop Oil is committed to non-violent resistance. Mm. We think that's the most effective way to win change in this country, and it's where the British public are at. So, we're and getting... what's the evidence for that, Ben? What, what is the evidence for that, that this is the most effective way of doing it? Because it hasn't really massively worked for you so far, has it, mate? I could, I could bore you with the social social studies, but I don't think you really want to hear them. Well, no, but go, uh, go on, mate, seriously, because you always, every single time I come on and I say, look, we've worked well to get towards net zero, you always tell me the same thing, which is that we haven't done anything, which actually means your actions haven't achieved anything, have they? So go on, what's the evidence? OK, well, if you want some evidence, just a couple months after Cressy blocked this, this motorway, in an unbelievably brave action, Keir Starmer came out, said the Labour Party are committed to no new oil and gas extraction, in mm. the North Sea, including in the North Sea at Davos, just a few months. We'll before. just take it from places like Iran, direct, won't we, Ben? You can draw a direct line between those two actions. Okay. I do not believe Keir Starmer would have done that if it wasn't for the brave okay. actions of Crest. All right, Ben. The other. All right, look, thank you very much. And I know we have our disagreements, but I do genuinely appreciate you coming on the show. So thank you very much. That is Ben Larson. Anyone there. who's with us, take but care. to just. All right, look, world. coming up, coming up, coming up. Why are we getting more migrants from Vietnam crossing the English Channel than any other nationality? Stay tuned. Warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello and welcome back to the latest update from the Met Office. Some showers will continue overnight, but otherwise it turns drier with clear spells and it turns chilly in places with our air now coming from the north. That's a cold direction with isobars out and opening out as well. Lighter winds will mean a greater chance of a frost. There will be widespread clear skies across the UK as the showers fade away, although one or two showers will continue across Northern Ireland, parts of Wales and the southwest, more especially for northeast Scotland, the North Sea coast as well. Some of the showers in northern Scotland will be falling as snow because it's going to be a cold night. Touch of frost here and there as we start off Wednesday. But beautiful blue skies for many of us, particularly through this central swathe of the UK. I think still the north and east of Scotland, eastern England, seeing a brisk breeze from the north and some showers. Also some showers elsewhere from the word go, but generally turning drier in many places by the afternoon, albeit rather cloudy. Northern Ireland seeing rain arrive and it will feel cold here, 7 Celsius, not much better elsewhere, 11 to 13 degrees at their highest in the south. But Thursday starts off bright once again, chilly in places, and we keep the brightness across the south and southeast well into the afternoon, whilst the cloud thickens across the north and northwest with outbreaks of rain moving south across Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England. The rain clears up on Friday. The weekend looks very nice indeed. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel 
gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. <laughs> nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. Every Saturday, 10 till 12, we'll bring you all of the news that you need to know. We'll also remind you that there is so much to smile about. It's my favourite time of the week. I get to relax, enjoy some light-hearted stories, and let Ellie teach me about fashion too. <laughs> That's Saturday Morning Live, every Saturday, 10 till 12. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. Thank you for joining us on GB News, Britain's news channel. It's 10 p.m. I'm Patrick Christie. Tonight, at least a dozen officers are reportedly investigating multiple allegations now against Angela Rayner, including tax matters, the electoral register, and other issues. What on earth is going on? What happened? What happened? What happened? Oh, ask the Marxist. That legally held opinions from people who are going to win national elections is no longer acceptable here. Democracy dies in Europe, plus. If all freedom means to you is you have the freedom to do what the government tells you you can do, you may as well move to Russia or China. Freedom of choice dies in Britain also. And they tell me that they're promised work here, promised living accommodation, that's going to be nice. And then when you speak to people six months, 12 months down the line, they do tell a very different story. It's non-stop Vietnamese channel migrants and... Dubai Deluge, are the shakes really in control of the weather? On my panel tonight, it is ex-MEP Patrick O'Flynn. I've got Tory Deputy Chairman Jonathan Gullis and author Amy Nicole Turner. Oh, yes, and what caused this parliamentary punch-up? <laughs> Get ready, Britain, here we go. Is Labour on the side of communist mafia tactics? Next. Patrick, thank you. Well, the top story from the GB newsroom tonight. The Times is reporting that the deputy Labour leader, Angela Rayner, is the subject of a multiple lead police investigation concerning alleged electoral law offences. The paper also says that police are looking into Miss Rayner's personal tax affairs on top of allegations that she supplied false information for the electoral register when she lived between her two former council homes in Stockport over ten years ago. Miss Rayner has previously said she'll step down if it's found she's committed any crime while insisting she's always followed the rules. Well, the other main story tonight is that the Prime Minister has told his Israeli counterpart that now is a moment for calm heads as Israel considers its response to Iran's missile and drone attack at the weekend. Rishi Sunak spoke to Benjamin Netanyahu on a call that was delayed 24 hours, with yesterday Israeli media reporting that Mr Netanyahu was refusing to take calls from world leaders seeking to influence his country's decision. A Downing Street spokesperson said tonight Rishi, Su uh, Rishi Sunak that reaffirmed the UK's support for Israel on the call. Well, Rishi Sunak's Rwanda plan has been dealt a series of defeats once again by the peers in the House of Lords tonight, further delaying passage of the government's flagship policy through Parliament. Despite MPs in the Commons overturning previous changes by the House of Lords, peers again pressed demands for revisions to the bill. It aims to remove illegal migrants who cross the English Channel in small boats and send them on to Rwanda for processing to act as a deterrent. 
Downing Street says the attempt by police in Brussels to shut down the National Conservatism Conference is extremely disturbing. Officers arrived while Nigel Farage was addressing the event, giving everyone 15 minutes to leave the venue. It's understood the order came from the local mayor, Emir Keir, in a move he said was to guarantee public safety. Belgium's Prime Minister, though, described the mayor's actions as unacceptable, saying that the Belgian constitution guaranteed freedom of speech and peaceful assembly since 1830 in his country. Now, you've heard of April showers, but what about this in Dubai? The desert city's unusually uh, rainy weather has blotted out the blue skies. It's been hit by torrential rain, thunderstorms, and the authorities have said people might as well just stay home. Videos uh, that uh, crept up online showed cars swamped with water, waves buffeting traffic, and roads brought to a standstill. Dubai Airport also saying it's temporarily diverting flights this evening until those weather conditions improve. But forecasters are saying another wave of unstable weather is on the way. That's the latest news. Do sign up to GB News Alerts, scan the QR code on the screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Democracy is dead in Europe. The message from Brussels today was loud and clear. If you have views that we don't like, we'll send the police in to shut you down. Those views, by the way, are the views of the majority. Controlling immigration, putting nat national interests first, lowering taxes, pushing back on climate lunacy. Here are the scenes from the National Conservatism Conference in Brussels. There we go. The old boys in blue, they were sent in by a red in the bed. The socialist mayor of Brussels, on top of a variety of different other mayors around principalities in Brussels, but this one is Philippe Close. Now, he actually hosted the ultra-radical former Iranian parliamentary turned mayor of Tehran in Belgium's capital last year. So he's got good taste, isn't he? This guy certainly knows what's right and what's wrong. So he's all right with actual fascists, then. People with hardline fundamentalist views. That man called Ali Riza Zakani, who was sanctioned by the UK for serious human rights violations and abuses. But he can't stand people like Suella Bravman or Nigel Farage. Well, here was Nigel's take at the time. Three police there. They have an order to close down this event. And when more police gather, that's exactly what they'll do. No alternative opinion allowed. This is the updated new form of communism. Well, he teed off on the mayor as well. Oh, I'm sorry. It's before the watershed. I really can't tell you what I think. He must be, he, he must be the most ghastly little person. Well, even the Belgian prime minister has come out against the socialist fanatic, saying what happened at the Claridge today is unacceptable. Municipal autonomy is a cornerstone of our democracy, but can never overrule the Belgian constitution guaranteeing the freedom of speech and peaceful assembly since 1830. Banning political meetings is unconstitutional, full stop, making reference there to the municipal mayors that also all stepped in to try and shut this down. But get this, the Labour Party in Britain, the party that could be about to rule over us for five years, they think the abolition of free speech, cancel culture and sending the police in to clamp down on views they disagree with is absolutely hilarious. Source close to the right, honourable member for Fareham, who couldn't be here today with us, Mr Deputy Speaker, because she's currently in Brussels, surrounded by uh, the police who are trying to sh shut down the event she's attending with some far-right fanatics um, with whom she has much in common. Um, she said that she is not a fan of the bill. Well, now she knows how the rest of us feel about the right, honourable member for Fareham, too. Hmm, OK. Wouldn't be a laughing matter if it was the other way around, though, would it? And Labour's Jonathan Ashworth is playing a very dangerous game in this clip here. I think some of the speakers, from what I understand, who have been advertised on the website for this conference have very unsavoury views. I'm rather surprised that Suella Braverman's been allowed to go and speak at this event. Why is Rishi Sunak not getting a grip of this situation? Why is he not asking Suella Braverman to pull out of this event? Because some of the characters involved at least according to their website, have made all kinds of comments which I don't think the Rishi Sunak's Tory party would want to associate themselves with. Ah, well, bingo. Hang on a minute, because Labour MPs are allowed to attend hate marches where swastikas and genocidal chants are common. It's almost like it's one rule for them and one rule for everyone else, isn't it? 
But we've seen it before from the socialists. Justin Trudeau in Canada, Jacinda Ardern as well in New Zealand. They behaved like tin pot dictators during COVID, reveling in the power, smashing, criminalizing, and demonizing anyone who got in their way. Look, today is a very dark day. There is nothing funny about the fact that if you have the wrong kind of views in Western Europe, the ruling elite will send the police round to shut you down. It is Soviet style tactics. They are not the good guys. Let's get the thoughts of my panel this evening. I've got columnist and political commentator Patrick O'Flynn, deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, Jonathan Gullis, and author and broadcaster Amy Nicole Turner. Patrick, deeply concerning stuff, this. If you have the wrong kind of views, Europe will shut you down. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I find it incredible that those two senior Labour front benches uh, don't get it. It actually reminds me of when Nigel Farage blew the whistle on the debanking scandal <coughs> and Rachel Reeves took the side <coughs> of the, the, the rich woman from, from Coots or Nat West mm, or, mm. or whatever it was, just, just missing the principle uh, involved here. It's a really chilling moment. I think it's fantastically interesting, by the way, that Rishi Sunak, who's normally very cautious, has issued a really punchy statement from Downing Street, after all, about another country's uh, goings on. And you might think, well, that's Rishi being nice to Nigel Farage. It isn't. What I think they'd be alarmed at in Downing Street is there was an event called the National Conservatism Com Conference yeah. going on, and who is the leading British Conservative who's all over the airwaves? It's Nigel Farage. It's not a member of the Conservative Party. So I think mm. Rishi Sunak is trying to get his leg over uh, this alarming story. But that's because he's uh, panicking. OK. Um, Jonathan, those Labour front benches chuckling away there as conservatism was rounded up by the police in Western Europe. You've got Jonathan Ashford saying, oh, what on earth was Rishi Sunak allowing Suella Bravman? To go to those things for, I thought he was playing quite a dangerous game. Though. Well, I think it's a damn disgrace, and I think the mask has slipped. West Streeting can try and rewrite history that somehow he's not some sort of uh, lunatic who thinks a trans woman is actually a biological woman, uh, as much as he wants to try and pretend what the past is in the past. And for them to laugh, and Jonathan Ashworth to say the nonsense he was saying, who I think is the head clown in that top tent of his uh, that he's performing in, when they all try to put Jeremy Corbyn into 10 Downing Street, a man who oversaw a Labour Party that was found to be institutionally anti Semitic to be found the only other party guilty of institutional racism against a certain group of people other than the BNP. And these people are trying to lecture us about this conference and laugh and mock people for having different views for them and being shut down by the police. It's a disgrace. The mayor, or whichever mayor it is, but the particular yeah. mayor in question, mayor. should be ashamed and appalled of himself. And uh, I, make, and I think Nigel should have reminded everyone that these people in Europe are just badly dressed bank clerks, as he once famously said in the European Parliament. Well, it's strong stuff. Amy, we could have five years of people who think it's really funny that the police can go in because people have different views to them. I think what they were finding really funny is that Suella Braverman is the elected MP for Fairham. It's today is quite an important bill going through the House of Commons and she was off it hosting a load of European nationalists, which is what they are. So if we talk about some of the speakers on the event, so, Jonathan, you said they have different views, right? There's one that's been investigated for far-right extremism. There's another that said um, the Christchurch shooter had legitimate concerns when he entered the mosque and, and opened fire. There's climate deniers, there's Putin uh, sympathisers. It's basically a circus of conspiracy theorists and misinformation, which actually is a threat to democracy rather than policing this event. But I think it should have gone ahead, because if it had gone ahead, everybody wouldn't be talking about it. Well, so, really, I think, if anything, this is Nigel Farage's absolute dream, isn't uh, it? It's another debanking. I can be the victim. I can say, oh, my God, look what they're cancelling okay, me. They're cancelling right, me. Right, right. I think he called okay, the John, police... Jonathan, frankly. do you want to come out to that? <laughs> and go to well, I think you've got a democratically elected senator, J.D. Vance, who I, is certainly not far right. He's just a, a good fashion Republican who believes in America. You've got Suella Braverman, who is a former Home Secretary, a democratically elected politician in this country. Nigel Farage, who is one of the leading members of the European Parliament, and actually, obviously, eventually, I think one of the most influential figures in British politics, mm -hmm. essentially, into the referendum that Is we had why are in they 2016. There? How are these people? Well, because I find it quite odd that we don't allow people to just have different views within conservatism. In fact, the Conservative Party, we are a broad church. I have differing views to some of my parliamentary colleagues on certain aspects and certain things. But with all things, there's give and there's take. But the public should be allowed to hear a wide variety of views and allow themselves to come up with their own conclusions as to what they like and dislike at the end of the day. Can I, I make a suggestion yeah, well, is that if we reassemble in a couple of months' time after the European parliamentary elections and we'll see which parties have done best 
with their publics and uh, We'll see if they're far right or if, in fact, they are the European mainstream. Because I predict it's the left-wing politically correct parties that are going to take an absolute cold bath when the people of, of Europe, who are still locked into the EU, uh, get to give their verdicts. All right. I mean, I mean, Amy, you know, they seem very quiet to call out actual genuine fascism, such as Islamist extremism. But the thing is, if there was a speaker at an event who was um, under investigation for Islamic extremism, you would be the first to want to close that event down. Mm -hmm. Yet this event is hosting a right wing of someone that's under. Well, that under feeds into my point right about Jonathan extremism. Ashworth. You know, so he's either saying, you uh, what, what on either earth are MPs either doing there and all that? To all well, Labour MPs are, are going to marches where there's swastikas on display and where there's chants of genocide and all of that stuff, and they keep tipping out for that, don't yeah, they? That's a mischaracterisation Just... of the marches. Oh, we have talked about this so many gosh, times. There, there are women with. Buggies at that marches. The hate so, marches. The it's hate a mischaracterisation. Sorry, it's a mischaracterisation. It's just, just a on. swastika. It's just a picture of Hitler. Doesn't matter at all. But you was that the majority of people there? Cutting, cutting, not, not making work. gestures to cut the throat no, 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 at uh, no. pro-Israeli well, sympathisers. But those people the majority were, those, of people at this particular event, they, was it, Amy? Well, yeah. Most of the speakers are from the Christian conservatism movement. If the fact that you've called it national conservatism, no. it isn't. It's nationalism. Most of the speakers, the speakers from Belgium were from the. You say nationalism. Right One second. Where's the in the chamber today, Amy? Where's streets in the chamber was mocking people as, who are libertarian, which we don't only believe because he was about the smoking ban in this case. Mm -hmm. So if he's mocking libertarianism, is he in favour of authoritarianism because that's the opposite of that? But he was so quick to say liberal, uh, you know, libertarianism is dangerous and silly and nonsensical. So I can only assume he's a big fan of authoritarianism, locking people down as we know Labour were during COVID, telling people what they can and can't do, full nanny state, which they're absolutely obsessed with, telling us, telling us himself, he's a that a trans woman is a woman that I should shut up and keep quiet because who am I to lecture uh, anyone else that I would know better? Oh, but we're, the election's coming and I'm on the Sun show, so actually, you know what? I'm going to just pretend to people that somehow my view has dramatically changed in the course of two years. He's a charlatan, he's a fraud, he should be embarrassed I think himself. Bill Ratham is a charlatan and a fraud for saying constantly when she was Home Secretary that we need to cl clamp down right. on de well, democratic on protest, peaceful protest, and now she's Amy, gone off to Brussels and she is was upset speaking at the event being... In a Conference room, in a private venue. Right? She wasn't spilling out onto the streets, lauding her extreme culture and intimidating people of other perspectives. This was a perfectly standard political conference in a venue. Right, well, which was happy. designed for that. And, you know, the, the various mayors who tried to close it down because mm. it was a threat to public safety, the only threat was from the far left, the Belgium Antifa people, mm. who were ringing up making making threats. You, you basically kowtow to them and giving them the right of veto over mainstream right of centre uh, uh, yeah. You did say one correct opinion. thing, though. You did just call Suella Braverman extreme, which is no, exactly I right. You did. I didn't at all her, extreme her extreme intimidating rhetoric. No, I <laughs> I was referring to the people on the hate marches and their extreme intimidating. I mean, I think we can. One thing that I would say about all of this is look, it may well be Soviet style tactics. It's certainly incredibly stupid because what's been leading the news agenda today on yeah. pretty much every single channel is this event. I'll be completely honest with you. I didn't even know that Nigel Farage was there until I saw his face on the television getting shut down by police earlier. So it's actually worked better for Farage and co, hasn't it? It's bad politics, at the very least. Anyway, coming up, Angela Rayner is reportedly facing multiple investigations into the sale of her council house. GB News' political editor, Christopher Hope, has the latest on a story that landed just an hour and ooh, about ten minutes ago. Plus, Denmark experiences its Notre Dame moment. So, now we will I'll show you that inferno in one of Copenhagen's most historic buildings and the very first of tomorrow's newspaper front pages. And next, more channel migrants have come from Vietnam than any other nation this year. And this is how we're trying to stop them. And they tell me that they're promised work here, promised living accommodation that's going to be nice. And then when you speak to people six months, 12 months down the line, they do tell a very different story. Has our Home Secretary made any attempt to actually get involved with this? I'll be joined live from Ho Chi Minh City by a human trafficking expert who will lift the lid for you on the criminal gangs fueling this surge in Vietnamese migrants. Don't miss it. Dubes & Co. Weekdays from 6pm.
you think this country needs new gas power stations? Apparently, this will all be about trying to get some form of energy security. Rishi Sunak has upset people today with this suggestion, people saying that actually this would do more damage to climate change uh, than it would do good. Where are you on it, Richard? Uh, I'll tell you exactly where. We need a lot more gas power stations and nuclear power stations because quite often the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Last week, we imported 16% of all our electricity because we haven't got enough capacity in the UK and we're now totally over-reliant on renewables. Um, the part of the problem is the lack of storage capacity, which mm. the government has finally got round to addressing. I think this as backup is actually quite a sensible idea. But they are not doing anything, as far as I can tell. At the moment, it will be retrofitted to have storage capability, which seems to be utterly bonkers. I mean, anyone who's got solar panels, um, you know, you know very well you're storing up energy. So it's about storage as much as production. And they could have gone, you know, 20 years ago, we could have had nuclear power. You know, we, we could have done more. We haven't looked far enough ahead in the future, and we are in grave danger of making the same mistake. I mean, the other side of this, is what is the difference going to be? Blackouts are, you know, they're irritating and... Irritating? It'd be disastrous to well, destroy would our now. economy. Well, they would be now, but, you know, um, some of us remember three-day weeks and things like that. And, in fact, you know, I grew up thinking that everybody had, you know, at least a couple of days a week when they had to eat off a of primer stove and things. This is, again, I don't want to harp on, but this is one of the problems in the politics in our country, isn't it? So many politicians, they just think in election cycles, Absolutely. they just think, what can I do and yeah. say to get my own backside re-elected uh, at the next general election? They're not always looking ahead. Uh, actually, politics aside, what is genuinely the best thing for this country? GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. This is Patrick Christie's Tonight Only on GB News. Coming up, I'll run you through the very first of tomorrow's newspaper front pages with my panel. But first, the migrant crisis in the Channel continues to worsen, with record numbers of small boat crossings so far this year. And after a sudden surge, Vietnamese migrants are now making the perilous journey more than any other nationality. We asked the Home Office for the exact figure. They were unable to provide one. Well, this paints a very different picture to last year when the Vietnamese made up just 5% of small boat crossings. Migrants have been travelling to the UK from Vietnam for years, though, but they apparently now favour small boats over lorries after 39 Vietnamese nationals were sadly and tragically found dead in a refrigerated truck back in 2019. The Home Secretary spent yesterday finalising deals and details of a new agreement with Vietnam to curb the flow of migrants. But in the meantime, this social media campaign seems to be the best attempt at prevention that he can muster. I've spoke to people who've got off a dinghy coming over from Calais and they tell me that they're promised work here, promised living accommodation that's going to be nice. And then when you speak to people six months, 12 months down the line, they do tell a very different story. Yeah, just bear in mind that that's gone out in Vietnam and it's in English. Yeah.
I'm delighted to welcome Mimi Vu, an anti-trafficking and modern slavery expert based in Vietnam. Mimi, look, thank you so much. Great to have you on the show. Why are so many Vietnamese migrants now crossing the English Channel? Um, thank you for having me on, Patrick. Um, the number of Vietnamese crossing the Channel right now is not related to a direct surge coming from Vietnam. Um, what it is is just basically, it's it comes and goes in waves. And this has been going on for the last 30 to 40 years. So most of the Vietnamese migrants who are crossing the channel now have already been in Europe for a number of weeks, months, or even a couple of years. And it's just a matter of um, transport and logistics, actually. Um, maybe some of the numbers from other groups have decreased or more opportunities mm. for um, the smugglers who are smuggling Vietnamese have increased, and so that's where you find the surge. And it's a, it's a trade, so everything is based on the principles of supply and demand. So you have, you know, demand from the Vietnam side, right, for Vietnamese who would want to go to Europe and the UK to work. Um, Vietnam is one of the top 10 countries in the world for remittances, meaning Vietnamese people go overseas to work mm. and send money back home. So it's usually between 4 to 7% of the country's total GDP. And then, that's what I don't um, quite understand, to, Mimi, if yeah. you don't mind me saying, that's what I don't quite understand, because, you know, it's, it's as you just said, it's really not uncommon for Vietnamese people to just mm -hmm. go abroad to work legally. So why are we mm -hmm. seeing so many of them illegally enter Britain, take that risk across the channel in a small boat? And also, as well, what kind of lines of work are they getting involved with mm -hmm. when they do arrive here? Um, it's not that they are knowingly and willingly entering illegally. It's mostly the end of the road for, of desperation for them. What is happening, um, and this has been shifting over time, is the tactics of the organized crime groups and the human smuggling networks that are all part of a larger transnational um, human smuggling, human trafficking, counterfeit goods, drug production, drug cultivation, um, transnational business network, essentially. And what it is, is the Vietnamese are going, and they often will go through Europe first um, on legal labor visas because they've been promised work in countries, for example, like Poland or Romania or Slovakia, but they've been charged exorbitant, uh, exor exorbitant amounts mm. of money from the labor brokers in Vietnam who are all part of this larger transnational human smuggling, human trafficking network. Are, are they um, not afraid of being deported at all? Are they not afraid of being deported? It's, it's not about being deported. What they're afraid of is not being able to repay their debt. Mm. Um, when you're in Vietnam and the thought of repaying a debt of 50,000 pounds, for example, it's mostly abstract, and you're dealing mainly with labor brokers who maybe introduce you to some money lenders, black market money lenders. When you're already in Europe and you've um, then taken the risk to go onto the UK because the work that you've been promised in Poland or in Romania has not materialized, or the salary was lower than you were told, or you've been exploited, and then the, your human smugglers and services say that the only way to make more money is to go to the UK, and they are put in further debt. And so you're much closer then to the actual criminal elements that are running the human trafficking and smuggling trade. And so then it becomes a fear of not just being deported, but fear of being. Um, it is. In debt I mean, I was reading that some game. people, Mimi, me, me, uh, can pay thirty thousand. I think you might have used the, the fifty thousand number there, but the one I read mm -hmm. today was thirty thousand pounds in order to end up finally getting into Britain. I just think, why don't they just book a plane ticket and fly here? Because it's completely, uh, it's very, very difficult for Vietnamese to get uh, legal visas as tourists, for example, into Europe and the UK. I mean, the paperwork hurdles that they have to go through. Mm. Um, is, is enormous. And the other thing also is the lack of information. So, for example, there are severe labor shortages all across Europe and the UK, and that's where the demand for Vietnamese labor comes from. And so there's okay. this push-pull factor, right? But mm. a lot of the Vietnamese, and the, most of the Vietnamese who are um, being trafficked and exploited and smuggled into the UK mm. come from only a handful of provinces in Vietnam, and they lack the information. These are not provinces in, in the major cities of yeah. Hanoi or Ho Chi Minh. And these are people who lack the information of um, how to obtain legal work visas in the UK, okay. how to um, get there safely. And so they rely on these unscrupulous labor brokers who lie to them and tell, promise them the world and overcharge them and put them in debt okay. bondage. Well, maybe yeah, look, thank you very stuff. much. Really, really. Really insightful stuff there. I'm sorry we're a bit pressed for time, but I do hope to talk to you again very soon. That's me and me view there. Thank you very, very much. Coming up, well, it all kicked off in the Georgian parliament yesterday, didn't it? <laughs> 
Can you guess what controversial new law caused that punch-up? I will reveal all very, very soon. But first, my panel, they're on standby. Why? Well, we've got the very first of tomorrow's newspaper front pages for you, so do not miss it. I'll see you in a tick. Hello and welcome back to the latest update from the Met Office. Some showers will continue overnight, but otherwise it turns drier with clear spells and it turns chilly in places with our air now coming from the north. That's a cold direction. And with isobars out and opening out as well, lighter winds will mean a greater chance of a frost. There will be widespread clear skies across the UK as the showers fade away, although one or two showers will continue across Northern Ireland. Parts of Wales and the southwest, more especially for northeast Scotland, the North Sea coast as well. Some of the showers in northern Scotland will be falling as snow because it's going to be a cold night. A touch of frost here and there as we start off Wednesday. But beautiful blue skies for many of us, particularly through this central swathe of the UK. I think still the north and east of Scotland, eastern England, seeing a brisk breeze from the north and some showers. Also some showers elsewhere from the word go. But generally turning drier in many places by the afternoon, albeit rather cloudy, Northern Ireland seeing rain arrive and it will feel cold here, 7 Celsius, not much better elsewhere, 11 to 13 degrees at their highest in the south. But Thursday starts off bright once again, chilly in places, and we keep the brightness across the south and southeast well into the afternoon whilst the cloud thickens across the north and northwest with outbreaks of rain moving south across Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England. The rain clears up on Friday. The weekend looks very nice indeed. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Saturday, 10 till 12, we'll bring you all of the news that you need to know. We'll also remind you that there is so much to smile about. It's my favourite time of the week. I get to relax, enjoy some lighthearted stories and let Ellie teach me about fashion too. <laughs> That's Saturday Morning Live, every Saturday, 10 till 12. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's Tonight. I've got tomorrow's front pages for you. Let's rattle through them. We go to the Daily Mail first. Victory for the bravest head teacher in Britain. Catherine Burble Singh hails landmark court ruling, backing her prayer ban. There is also that big picture story there. Angela Rayner, police probe, multiple allegations. We'll come to that shortly. The son, Kyle's a dad for the sixth time. Boy number four with Annie. City ace, Kyle Walker, held her hand. Well, I think that's the least he can do. Uh, let's go to The Guardian. Tory divisions exposed as Sunak smoking ban moves a step closer. We're going to zone in on that again very shortly. There was a rebellion there. Uh, let's go to the Daily Express. Victory for all schools as prayer ritual ban is backed. Yeah. And let's go to the Times. Uh, this is the story. Police look at multiple allegations over Angela Rayner. Investigation is expected to take weeks. And we are joined now in an unprecedented move because that's how big the story is. With our political editor, Christopher Hope. Christopher, thank you very, very much. Look, what's all this then for Angela Rayner? Well, an evening, Patrick. Great to be on your show. Yeah, to me, it shows uh, the problems Labour has got because they've allowed they allow this to drag on and on. We haven't seen any of the evidence which Angela Rayner says proves her innocence, nor is Sir Keir Starmer. That's been seen by advisors to Sir Keir Starmer. And I think this, what we're seeing here is now the police are talking in Greater Manchester. There's been an interview today with, with uh, Stephen Watson, Chief Constable. He told local radio in Manchester 
So a number of assertions knocking about, and we're going to get to the bottom of what's happened. The Times report tonight, 12 of us are looking at multiple allegations. It looks though the scope of the of the examination of the allegations hasn't changed that much. We know tax matters are being looked at, mm. and we know whether Angela Rayner um, gave false information uh, for the electoral register when she lived those two in between those two foot those two former council houses in stock. So what we do know is the, is the, the limit of what they're looking at. Um, but it does show to me how in politics, as soon as you have um, the police getting involved, then any kind of control over it disappears. It may be that Angela never could control this, but there was opportunity at some point to go to come clean with it all, lay it all out for all to see. That hasn't happened. And of course, she does maintain her innocence. She's very clear on that. A long statement out. From Labour tonight. Well, this now, Trump, uh, this now rumbles on for weeks, doesn't it? This rumbles on for weeks now. That's it's expected point. to at least a dozen officers at Greater Manchester Police for investigating it. That makes it sound incredibly serious. Obviously, it may all come to nothing. She denies everything, as you said there. They are examining tax matters and other issues, as well as the question of whether Rayner gave false information. This is not a non story, is it? It never was a non-story. I know people on Twitter are trying to second-guess what the police might be looking at and whether some offences or, or that may have been a committed, uh, which you would deny, have been spent. But this, to me, shows, Patrick, this will go right into the autumn. And that's why I think what's so interesting. These uh, investigations, we saw that with, with Beergate, with Keir Starmer, and no, 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 no problem there. We saw those fines issued in Downing Street over COVID. It shows to me how this now is, is, is an issue that will be a shadow, I think, over Angela Rayner going forward into the election. She'll want it cleared. She welcomes, of course, the police investigation. She thinks that will mean she can get her name cleared. But now it will ex happen again. We'll have uh, updates from, from Greater Manchester Police. We know Andy, B Andy Burnham, the Mayor of Manchester, is standing, staying outside of all this. Yeah. But we here we have Greater Manchester Police and Stephen Watson trying to tell the country we will do a good job here. A dozen officers shows it's serious, and it will go on, I think, until the EV election, probably, in time scale. Oof. Oh, Christopher, thank you very much. That is our political editor, Christopher Hope, there, pulling the late shift for us this evening. Great. Look, in a statement, Angela Rayner has said, I have repeatedly said I would welcome the chance to sit down with the appropriate authorities, including police and HMRC, to set out the facts and draw a line under this matter. I am completely confident. I've followed all the rules at all times. I've always said that integrity and accountability are important in politics. That's why it's important that this is urgently looked at independently and without political interference. We have seen the Tory party use this playbook before for reporting political opponents to the police during election campaigns to distract from their record. I will say, as I did before, if I committed a criminal offence, I would, of course, do the right thing and step down. The British public deserves politicians who know the rules apply to them. The questions raised relate to a time before I was an MP and I have set out my family circumstances and taken expert tax and legal advice. I look forward to setting out the facts with the relevant authorities at the earliest opportunity. I am joined now by my press pack, columnist and political commentator Patrick O'Flynn, Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party, Jonathan Gullett, author and broadcaster Amy Nicole Turner. Just sticking with this, Patrick, no one actually welcomes a police investigation, do they? Uh, no, but I think Angela Rayner there is sounding very confident, isn't she? And we, you know, uh, Christopher Hope mm -hmm. mentioned Beergate, <clears throat> and at the time, you know, that was talked up as Starmer on the brink, and he said he'd resign if, if he was found to have broken the law. And nothing happened. I would, if I was the Conservatives, I would restrain myself from putting all your, your hopes into a, a police investigation. I think Greater Manchester Police want to be seen to do a thorough job. Mm. Uh, it's very important that Angela Rayner is seen to obey the law of the land. She aspires yeah. to be Deputy Prime Minister. She probably aspires to be more than that, actually. But I just don't see this getting the Conservative Party out of the ditch they're in. Well, there's, there's that. I mean, you know, the argument, Jonathan, would be with this, that actually, you know, this is a bit of a distraction. And, uh, you know, e even if the worst-case scenario happens, which Angela Rayner would, you know, categorically deny is even a possibility, but it does, they might end up just replacing it with someone who's more moderate, more popular. 
Well, I think at the end of the day, this is about making sure the rules apply to everyone and everyone equally and fairly. And at the end of the day, Angela Rain herself, as maybe now uh, she'll reflect on some of the things she said, but you know, bearing in mind that she called on Boris Johnson to resign for simply just mm. being investigated. She's obviously used quite unparliamentary language, referring to some Conservative MPs as scum in the past as well. So, you know, you reap what you sow at the end of the right. day. Um, look, I'm, I'm just going to move the story on a, a little bit because I do want to cover this and we're a bit pressed for time. And again, I will emphasise that Angela Rayner obviously denies any wrongdoing or welcomes the police investigation. Now, Tory MP Sir Jake Berry voted against Rishi Sunak's smoking bill that will prevent generations of kids from ever smoking, apparently. He spoke to GB News political editor earlier this evening. I live in a country where the government tells you what car to buy, what central heating you can have in your phone, looks to arrest you for misgendering people. I believe in freedom. And if you are free as a nation, you, it's freedom to make good choices as well as bad choices. This is slipping towards a sort of social democratic, socialist country. Frankly, if all freedom means to you is you have the freedom to do what the government tells you you can do, you may as well move to Russia or China. All right, Braveheart. Crying about freedom there quite a lot. Uh, Amy, are you for or against the, uh, the smoking ban? Um, I'm against smoking, but I'm also against this ban because it doesn't seem mm. to make sense to me. Live and let um, smoke. I'm kind of convinced that Rishi Sunak just wants a little legacy so he can be remembered for the, as the Prime Minister that, that um, stumped out smoking. But really, how would this work in practice? So you'd have a 31-year-old yeah. and a 30-year-old and would you have to be ID'd forever? Yeah. Yes. So would you be expected to carry ID to present to a shopkeeper who's already got enough problems? Yeah, but also, also seriously, if someone approached me, you know, in a supermarket car park and by the time when I'm, like, 80 and they're 40 or whatever and I buy them a deck of camel blues, I'd yeah, get nicked, yeah. you know, which, is, which is ridiculous. Jonathan, the story here, really, I suppose, is that there's massive Tory divisions here, a revolt of apparently 50-odd, wasn't it, including Kemi Bandernock. Um, why, why on earth has Rishi Sunak decided to do this? Well, look, the Prime Minister made it very clear this was a free vote and a genuine free vote that allowed people to vote with their conscience. And I joined Jake Berry and Kane Badenoch in the no lobby because I personally felt that the whilst I completely support the ban on uh, some of these vapes, these uh, disposable vapes in particular, mm. that are marketed and targeted at children, I see far too many in Stoke-on-Trent North, sadly, using them. I thought when it came to smoking, the fact that potentially even with a day apart in terms of being born, that yeah. one person would mm. be able to purchase cigarettes and one wouldn't so would Richard be just Sunak's unenforceable. Not, not going to have a problem with the fact that the guy he's just appointed to be his deputy party chairman has just wandered straight into the no lobby. Do you know what, Patrick? I know you're doing a good job staring and I appreciate you trying. But what I will remind you of is it was a free vote and therefore <laughs> the Conservative MPs were allowed to vote with their conscience and I joined a number of other colleagues yeah. as well as those, some uh, of those shows who abstained. And for, I think for, at the end of the day, yeah. you know, the, the, of course we need to stop and we'll try and end smoking, but we also need to look at obesity, which is also a huge strain. And I know the irony of saying that as someone who's got far too much lard around their waist as well. Yeah. But that is, for me, a bigger challenge, and actually we should put more funding into yeah. preventative health care, as well as education. Hardly anyone smokes. Hardly right. anyone smokes. Particularly All 18 right. to 24 years, I think 1% of them... It is naturally falling. And, yeah, exactly. And, and, and it's also, its own bottom. Uh, as well, stir, stir the pot as I may. Uh, you know, I, I, um, I think you're probably on the right side of history, that one, Jonathan, to be fair. Patrick, unfortunately, we haven't quite got time to come to you on this just yet, okay. because we've got a couple of other bits and bobs that I need to rattle through. Um, so, let's do it. Uh, Danish cultural heritage was set on fire earlier. Take a little look at this historic Copenhagen Stock Exchange, which is in the midst of a renovation. It's gone up in flames. The 17th century Borsen is one of the city's oldest buildings and caught fire in the early hours of this morning, leading to the collapse of this iconic 183-foot old spire. Residents have dubbed the incident Copenhagen's Notre Dame moment. Well, as far as we know, no one was harmed and the cause of the fire is still unknown. But coming up, after the damning cash report is published, is Labour part of the problem for espousing dangerous trans ideology. We debate that in tonight's Greatest Britain Union Jackass. But first, what has gone on in the Georgian Parliament? <laughs> I'll explain what sparked that punch-up in just a few seconds. Don't go anywhere, and I'll have more front pages for you as well. Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. Good evening. Well, I thought it was an absolutely knockout front page of the sun that went online last night and was on display all over the country today. Union joke. And there is 
Well, you can just about make out that it's the Union flag, better known perhaps as the Union Jack, but they've decided to add pink and all sorts of colours to it, and that is on sale uh, for fans going to the Olympics in France this year to buy and to wear, which led to a great big panic. What on earth would be on the shirts, shorts and kit of the athletes. Well, a statement did come out mid-morning from the British Olympic Association which said all Team GB athletes will wear the Union Jack as normal in Paris. However, Team GB kit itself is expected to include different shades of blue or red as in previous years. Well, I'm sorry, I don't really buy that. Now, we sent Adam Cherry out to Wembley today to ask some members of the public how they felt about this. This episode of companies fixing things that weren't broken. We're going to be asking the people of London what they think of the changing colours of the Team GB Olympic logo. Take a look at this. The blue, the red and the, the white, it's perfect. I feel like, you know, it shouldn't be that controversial, controversial but, you know, it's iconic. I feel like the, yeah. the, the colours are iconic. Everyone's known London for being, you know, red, white and blue. I feel like it doesn't really represent England like that. Yeah, the yeah. the colours of the... Like the colours are kind of random. I, I think it's very colourful. Mm. It's very uh, pinkish and uh, quite unicornish kind of thing, yeah. A bit too unicornish for Team GB. A little bit. Disgusting. Well, we're British. And our colours are not pink and what purple and... Uh, like, you know, some patterns on there. Yeah, it's yeah, all yeah, going crazy. That's, that's not our flag. Yeah. That don't represent me. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's Tonight. It's time for more of tomorrow's Front Pages. The Metro, Strict Heads Pray Time win. I don't know if that's party time. That will be another story entirely. Strict Heads Pray Time win. Uh, a Muslim pupil has lost a high court challenge against a ban on prayer rituals. That's Catherine Burble saying we heard from her earlier on in this show. Sunak in the eye. Sunak gives Netanyahu a warning from world leaders. British Prime Minister urges Israeli counterparts to show calm ahead and avoid military escalation with Iran. Let's go to the Telegraph. Leadership hopefuls defy Sunak over smoking ban. We've just covered that. Also, a picture of Nigel Farage looking rather annoyed as he leaves that event in Brussels. They also touch on the prayer ban. They also have a story here. Uh, again, Angela Rayner investigated over multiple claims uh, and frozen Russian assets will help fund Ukraine as G7 deal Near. So I'm joined again by my press pack, columnist and political commentator Patrick O'Flynn, deputy chairman of the Tory party, Jonathan Gullis MP, and author and broadcaster Amy Nicole Turner. Now, if you thought the House of Commons benches could get unruly, the Georgian Parliament takes it to a whole new level. As MP Aleko Elishavili, I'm fluent, failed to control his passions when a bill that he opposed to was passed. Watch. Uh, I'm <laughs> Can I just ask, does, if we had any chance, we just play that again. Does he make the noise oosh as he punches him in the side of the head? And is there any possible for us? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. I'm sakit chip. Tina bokuchawa shekit hotanzu. OK, all right. Look, apparently these scenes are not that uncommon. Uh, after another fistfight broke out over the same bill back in March. Now, astonishing pictures. Um, yes, that, that was what that was. Um, look, Patrick, have you ever nearly come to blows? No, when I was a UKIP MEP, we had a celebrated altercation between two of my colleagues. But unfortunately, it took place in an ante room. They, they went out through two separate doors into this ante room to settle their differences. And then one of them came back through the door quite quickly. So no one's exactly sure. But one of them then collapsed happened. in a rather public area. Uh, some hours later, yeah. one of them Remarkable, uh, isn't it? sort of fell down, yeah. So I would have to say that was very rare even for UKIP MEP meetings where there were lively exchanges of views. You must have wanted to do that a couple of times, Sean. <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of people who want to do that to me, Patrick. <laughs> um, look, I, I, I'm all for exchanging words and uh, having noises. a good bit of banter back and forth and, and, and noises yeah. as well. I like the noises. But I, uh, I like a bit of year, year, year on the benches to cheer my colleagues on. But, Perfect. yeah, I look, fisticuffs are unnecessary, um, but... I'm, I'm, what I want to do is now is research what this 
this bill was that's so so controversial. Yeah, I know, I know. Smoking ban. <laughs> Smoking ban. Yeah, look, apparently it's about foreign agents in Georgia. They obviously feel very, very strongly uh, about it. But I mean, Amy, look, we think we have unsavoury political discourse over well, here. Yeah. They're beating each other up in Georgia. Exactly. I mean, people like to comment on Jonathan's um, conduct within the chamber. But look, what, what, what you could have watched. What's wrong see? with Jonathan's conduct? Look, I love in it. I chamber. love it. But a lot of people say, you know, it's the two sides and the jeering and the shouting and maybe we should be a bit calmer and we might get more things done. But, hey, look, what, look how bad it could get. Look how bad it could get. At least we're not in Georgia. Now to astonishing <laughs> pictures to show you here from the desert city of Dubai. It's underwater. Torrential rain and violent thunderstorms have caused chaos, with planes being forced to taxi through floodwaters as nearly 50 flights in and out of the city have been cancelled. Flooding also descended into indoor spaces, including this shopping centre... Dubai surpassed its yearly rainfall of 4.7 inches in less than a day. Uh, there we go. Patrick, I mean, this is... I mean, our mate, I can't remember what he was called with the long hair from Just Stop All at the end of the last hour, but, you know, he's right, isn't he? Uh, well, I think we've always had extreme weather, and at least in Dubai they've got a few quid to uh, build new flood defences. Yeah. They think they need them. Your holiday's off, Jonathan. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm quite... I'm just quite shocked. I didn't think Dubai could flood, so I'm, yeah. really, I, I'm really bamboozled by what's happened. Um, I, I, I think London today's been bizarre. It's gone yeah. from sunny to torrential rain to thunder, thunder, and then back to sunshine again. Yeah. I don't know whether to wear a coat or not half the time at the moment. Some would argue, Amy, this is an extreme example of climate change. Well, yeah, I think it's the extreme weather and the frequency of the extreme weather, isn't it, that points to climate change, rather than just saying, oh, we've always had a bit of floods. Yes, we have, but not as frequently as we do now. And other people also point to... Um, spurious allegations that Dubai does indeed try to control its own weather with things like cloud seeding and that maybe that went wrong but who are we to comment? Well it's time now to reveal today's greatest prisoner union jackass Right I'm reliably informed this is a lively one. Patrick who is your greatest Britain please? Well my greatest Britain is actually a female Labour MP Rosie Duffield who fought the good fight on the trans issue and, and protecting women's spaces as a lone voice in her party, intimidated, uh, abused by her own colleagues. And this week with the cast review, she's been entirely vindicated. And I say, well done her. It's easy to have an opinion mm -hmm. when 90% of your party's on your side, but when you're standing yeah. separately and on your own, you need real integrity. Let's play the clip. Those who've raised this issue over the last few years desperately concerned about the safeguarding of vulnerable children and young people are owed a heartfelt apology for being no platformed, ghosted, sidelined and disciplined at the behest of a few extreme groups of activists, some within political parties. Yes, uh, Lloyd Russell Moyle very quiet at the moment, isn't he? I wonder where he's gone. Anyway, uh, Jonathan, who's your greatest Briton? I've gone with Victoria Atkins, who skewered the charlatan that is Wes Streeting in the House of Commons yesterday over his sudden conversion when it comes to trans and the fact that a trans woman mm. is now a trans woman, not just a biological woman in his eyes. But, you know, sometimes people have to go along the long road to Damascus. Mm. We've got another clip ideology he and his colleagues yeah. espoused yeah. was part of the problem. Yeah. And does he now have the good grace to apologise to those who have been maligned in public life, including his own female colleagues? Yes, uh, strong stuff. I mean, they can't hide from the receipts that are about to be served to them. Amy, who is your greatest Briton? Do you remember Blur? Uh, oh, yes. Right. Jonathan, do you remember Blur? No, not really. Well, yeah, this could be the problem there. So they say so they were back. Damon Albarn was back yeah. at Coachella in America. Big festival and, in America. Um, big, huge, huge, like the yeah, Glastonbury of LA, maybe. Yeah, yeah. he's very woke. Um, no one knew who they were. No one knew. No. So I thought this was very sad. So I wanted to nominate Damon Albarn okay. and, and friends so that um, he can feel loved and appreciated as he is here on these shores. Now here's what happened. Apart from by Jonathan. Yes, yeah, so here's what happened because um, he lost it a bit on stage. <laughs> Oh, no. Yeah. Bad day out for the lad there. Bad day out. Right, today's greatest Britain is Rosie Duffield MP. Well done, Rosie, uh, for standing up. Uh, although, to be fair, any of those could have won. Who's your union jackass, Patrick? Well, it's another Labour woman MP, actually. This is Annalise Dodds, the party chair and shadow equalities 
minister. She oh. came out with this new uh, crusade today, uh, saying that the Tory economic policies, which obviously Labour opposes, she claimed that they'd hit uh, ethnic minority-owned small businesses disproportionately and that Labour would come up with a scheme to... to help mm. ethnic minority-owned businesses more, I assume, than white-owned businesses. This is racialising everything. We should be trying to get away from racial identity politics. She'll just stir up division. Yeah. She'll be uh, there for lobby groups. She'll be chucking taxpayers' money in an entirely counterproductive direction. I just don't get direction. Would, what kind of people advise these people. Anyway, Jonathan, who's your union jackass? Uh, one for the Brussels Bolshevik that is Philippe Comey Close, uh, the mayor of Brussels, having uh, tried to shut down democracy, shut down free speech, and shown himself to be the head of the big crown tent that is the European Union. That is our uh, next ambassador to Belgium, Jonathan Gullis. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, union Jackass nomination. Amy, who's your Union Jackass? Um, it's Suella Braverman, MP, oh. um, for ducking out of today's vote to go and schmooze a load of European nationalists, oh, because that's what the people of Fairham need. God, is it what the people of Farham need, Jonathan? You know, I mean... Well, I think the, 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 bill's, the bill itself has passed through to the next stage and I think Swella Bradman is more than perfectly entitled to go but and expel her what views, use which is her that? voters can then actually hold her to her constituents? To uh, oh, well, I, how is that helping we, her Should we not allow the Foreign Secretary to go abroad at any stage? She's not the Foreign Secretary. Should we not? OK, so Labour MPs <laughs> to go abroad at any stage? Should they She's not be the able MP to do that? She's the MP for Farham. I think so, it makes sense for the so Foreign Secretary Labour MPs talking about Palestine Gaza, should they shut up because that's not no use to their constituents? It's completely of relevance to their constituents. They're not the MP for Gaza. I, I know some of them want to be a spokesperson for Hamas, <laughs> but you know, at the end of the day, it's not actually relevant to their constituents. What matters to their constituents is potholes getting filled, buses running on time, which, by the way, in Stoke Audrey, it's happening thanks to Conservative government funding and, and a Conservative Braverman. Council for 2019 right. 2023. So, but how does bus lanes and potholes link to Stoella Braverman attending a conference about homophobia? Because she's talking about how we can have a growing economy that means we can invest in public services. Right. All right, today's union jackass is. <laughs> The mayor of Brussels, Philippe Clus. There we go. Well done. Uh, all right, guys. Thank you very much. I got a bit live at the end now, which is uh, exactly what we we're after. So well done. <laughs> Couldn't quite make out what either of you two were saying. So if I need to apologise to anyone, I'll do it now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who watched and listened at home. I will see you tomorrow at 9 p.m. Headliners next. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of Weather on GB News. Hello and welcome back to the latest update from the Met Office. Some showers will continue overnight, but otherwise it turns drier with clear spells and it turns chilly in places with our air now coming from the north. That's a cold direction. And with isobars out and opening out as well, lighter winds will mean a greater chance of a frost. There will be widespread clear skies across the UK as the showers fade away, although one or two showers will continue across Northern Ireland, parts of Wales and the southwest, more especially for northeast Scotland, the North Sea coast as well. Some of the showers in northern Scotland will be falling as snow because it's going to be a cold night. Touch of frost here and there as we start off Wednesday. But beautiful blue skies for many of us, particularly through this central swathe of the UK. I think still the north and east of Scotland, eastern England, seeing a brisk breeze from the north and some showers. Also some showers elsewhere from the word go, but generally turning drier in many places by the afternoon, albeit rather cloudy. Northern Ireland seeing rain arrive and it will feel cold here, 7 Celsius, not much better elsewhere, 11 to 13 degrees at their highest in the south. But Thursday starts off bright once again, chilly in places, and we keep the brightness across the south and southeast well into the afternoon, whilst the cloud thickens across the north and northwest with outbreaks of rain moving south across Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Northern England. The rain clears up on Friday. The weekend looks very nice indeed. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. 
For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. The perception of a crime being committed um, is not based on whether that person intended to commit a crime or not, but whether the victim, in inverted commas, uh, or anybody else for that matter who happened to hear whatever was said, uh, determines that um, it was motivated by malice or ill will. Most of these things come out in, in heated exchanges or in, you know, very casual exchanges. Mm. Uh, and then somebody says, oh, I'm offended or I'm hurt or I'm whatever because this was clearly uh, malicious and it's against me as a, uh, a, a black person um, or a, a transgender uh, or sexual uh, sexuality, whatever it might be. And somebody says, I perceive this to be uh, motivated by hate. Mm. Now, at that point... That what is the reasonable test um, that anybody could apply as to what was in somebody's mind at the time? You don't know what I'm thinking now. I don't know what you're thinking now. Why is it that a crime can be 